reading along in the scriptures one day and you come across, it says, but Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So you say, wait a second, but doesn't the world have these um, church systems set up and everything? Okay, this is obviously something doesn't make sense about this. So I'll have to do a little research here. So he's saying that the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and they their, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. So he's saying, y'all aren't going to do it this way. So what, we, what we're going to do is we're going to look up exercise lordship and exercise authority in some resources since he said that we're not going to do it that way. One second, sorry. The sun just got covered by a cloud, so I can't, couldn't see anything. Okay, so um, we're going to look that up. Okay, so there's a couple ways you can do it. Here's the interlinear Bible. And over here is the, the Strong's Concordance. So we can go here to the interlinear Bible and open up there to Mark. And it says, it actually said um, 1634, but that was a mistake. It was supposed to be 2634 because when I went to look it up, it wasn't there. It was in the E's instead of the, um, the Kappa here. It was in the Epsilon. Um, 1634 is in the Epsilon, so it was actually meant to be 2634. And then right here we have, and and that word is Lord it over, so Lord over it. And then right here, um, exercise authority is, or exercise authority over is katexousia zosin, and this one is katakuri aus, et So, okay, so what we're going to do, is we're going to go over here to our theological dictionary of the New Testament, and we're going to look at the index volume. So what you do is you just open up to the, the Greek section. It goes English, and then it goes um, English, Hebrew, and then Greek. Or let me see. It actually goes English. Um, one second, sorry. So it actually goes English. Greek, Hebrew. So we go to the Greek and we look up that word. And so here they made the, the K's, X's. Sometimes they, sometimes they do that in these resources. So Ketexousioadzo right there and Katakuri or sorry, Katakuri Eo. So this one right here is in 3, 10, 98, volume 3, page 10, 98. And this one right here is in volume 2, page 575. So what we do is we get our volume 2 and our volume 3, and we open to those pages. So go ahead and open them to those pages. Cataxiadzo and... Kata Curiao. Okay, so he said that we're not going to do this. We're not going to do this. And it's like, wait a second. Isn't that what all these churches do? Yeah, that is what they all do, but we're not going to do that. So right here it says, um, so it says, this word means not, to mis not the misuse of power, but it's possession and exercise. So no power at all. It is not found elsewhere in secular Greek, nor in the Septuagint. Um, our Josephus, our Philo, it's not found in any of those. So in the New Testament, it occurs only at Mark 10.42. Here, its primary sense is that they exercise power over them. There is no earthly government without the use of force. But if the reference is oi megaloi, is not merely to the authorities. It is likely that the word implies the tendency towards compulsion or oppression, which is imminent in all earthly power. So all earthly power. And not merely in political. 
the word also seems to be used in this sense in Acts. Thumb. So um, I put out here to the side, leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees and leaven of Herod. So these people think that they can teach contrary to God's word and come up with all these philosophies and like the r rabbis in the Jewish synagogues and the Aristotelian and Platonic philosophies that came out of Greece. The Greece the Grecians thought it was foolishness, Paul said, when he was trying to preach to them. So um, they try to turn everything into Grecian philosophy like at the seminaries nowadays. So the school of Halil and Shammai under the Pharisees is like, and um, the Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato, that's like all of that has been reeled into the American seminaries. So right here, Kadokurieo, it says, um, it came to mean to have title to something. Much later, it says, so in the Septuagint, it is almost always used of the rule of an alien, e.g. of man over the earth, or over animals, or of sin over man, of foreign conquest and domination. It says it occurs in the New Testament at Mark 10, 42. Here, the kata, which is used twice in the parallelism, is not without significance significance and the word means the exercise of dominion against someone like in the Circe the um Kersey's little churches that they've come up with where they've created a clergy and a uh, laity and they have a pulpit pew system that came out of um the corruptions from like Theophilus, Tertullian and um Cyprian and these other people who began to want to have the bishop of Rome be in charge and hence under the Rome the Roman papacy that is to one's own advantage another instance is acts 19:16 where it occurs with reference to man possession of an unclean spirit similarly the force of the kata may still be seen in 1 Peter 5:2 that is the elders each over his portion are to, not to exercise their power for themselves and therewith against those entrusted to them. So they're not to exercise their power for themselves and therewith against those entrusted to them or to exercise power over the people entrusted to them. So we're going to look at that reference in Peter over here, right here in um, this interlinear Bible. So it says right here that Shepherd, um, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not by compulsion, but willingly, nor eagerly for base gain, but readily, nor as exercising lordship over the ones allotted to you, but becoming examples of the flock. So a believer is there to set the example, not to dress up in tuxedos and to drive a really nice car at the expense of the people under you. That's why it says not nor eagerly for base gain because people making a profit. In fact, Acts says there's a distribution should be made. So, um, okay, guys. So we've looked at all these resources. Another way you could have done that is you could have came to your Strong's Concordance and you could have opened up to exercise and you'll find that almost every single place is about this whole concept. So it shows you in Mark and in Luke um, about the exercising authority right there. So then you would open to um, 2634 or 2715. So 2634, which is what we looked up earlier. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure how that got there. All right, so 2634. 2634, 2634. 34, yeah. Kare curia and to lord it over. Gain over, or uh, gain dominion over, subdue, yeah. And then I think I said 2613, I can't remember. Let me see, 2613. Ah, uh, no, that wasn't it. Um, let me see, so 26, or 2715, so 2715. Right here, Carter, Carter Excelsizo, or... Good text, I'll see, so that's a hard one, to exercise authority over. Okay, so there's just a couple ways you can look up the definitions there. And we looked up First Peter 
chapter 5, verses 3, where it says you won't exercise authority over the flock. And we looked at where Jesus says, you're not going to be like the Gentiles and have this hierarchy. And um, you'll find that there was no hierarchy in the early um, among the early believers. Let me see if I can find a, a book real quick before I run out of time. If I run out of time, I'm just going to end it. But um, yeah, I don't know where that book is right away. Let me see. Let me see. Um, you know what? I think I might know where it is. Nuh-uh. I'm making a video. <laughs> um, uh, let me see. Mm, I'm looking at my bookshelf here, but I can't find the... Oh, here it is. Alright, so, right here, it actually says... If I run out of time, sorry guys, I won't get to read this. So it says, um, right there it says, In these early days, the titles of church officials were not clearly defined. Some of them were interchangeable, e.g. overseer for elder. Um, so we actually see in here that it, it explains like it was, it was, a very simple organization in which no sophisticated hierarchy was involved. And it's talking about the, um, the primitive church. There was no, um, nothing like you see today. It was just believers who got together and rejoiced in the Lord. And there was, um, and the same thing happens today amongst true believers. And it occurs because the spirit wants it to occur. So that's the, Thompson Chain Reference Bible Companion. So, all right. Well, I hope that this has helped, and I appreciate y'all taking the time to watch. We've gone over a bunch of books, and all right, appreciate it, y'all. Take it easy. Bye. This Thompson Chain Reference Bible Companion, he actually says right here, he says that um, some say that the pastoral epistles reveal a more advanced church organization than we find in the rest of the New Testament, and presumably too advanced for Paul's day, based on the mention of bishops or overseers, and the elders or presbyters and deacons in what seems a firmly established church organization of a latter day. However, on his first missionary journey, Paul ordained elders in every city, Acts 14.23. Another reference indicates the presence of pastors and teachers at Ephesus, Ephesians 4.11, while in Philippi, bishops and deacons were active, Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. It was a very simple organization in which no sophisticated hierarchy was involved. In these early days, the titles of church officials were not clearly defined. Some of them were interchangeable, e.g. overseer for elder, Titus 1, 5, verses 5-7. through 7. So these were actually... Um, poor people. These weren't um, the money-making scoundrels like we see in the world today who are just getting rich off of um, selling a false Christ. And then right here in History of the Church by um, Apo um, by Philip Schaeff and um, Apostolic Christianity. I believe that's his name. Let me see. Just to make sure. Verify that fact. Yeah, Philip Schaeff. So this is apostolic Christianity, which means the very beginnings, right? So um, it actually says right here, Peter also warns against hierarchical ambition in prophetic anticipation of the abuse of his name and his primacy among the apostles. And that's why um, he, Paul, P Peter warned you of that in 1 Peter chapter 4 and in um, and in. 1 Peter chapter 5, because right here he explains that, um, he, he explains, let me see, it's been a little while since I looked this up, so let me see, oh yeah, right up here he says, oh yeah, right here he says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's affairs. Now this allo 
episcopos. Episcopos means bishop, so bishoping over other people. So a bishop isn't someone who's going to be a meddler. He's going to ensure that people are upholding the word of God, and that's why they're going to want to kill the bishop. That's why all of the apostles were persecuted and most of them murdered. So right here in um, Antinicene Christianity by Philip Schaeff, he, um, over here, this is a quote by um, Clement. It says, so for example, in the well-known passage of Clement, as if one should be changed from a man to a beast after the manner of one charmed by Circe, so a man ceases to be God's and to, and to continue faithful to the Lord when he sets himself up against the church tradition and flies off the positions of human caprice to fluctuate, be whimsy, fickle, you know, so um, to just be tossed to and fro. And Circe is where we is where the word church comes from. I've done a lot of research on that on my other videos. I have a whole library on just Circe alone. That's where the word church comes from. The ecclesia, the called out, isn't the same as a, as church. So um, those are a couple of the warnings there against these um, false church systems that are going on. And oh yeah, right here. In this book right here, he's explaining that um, dur during the um, translation of the King James Bible, it was a, all it was all about politics. So he says, um, he says, what he would not tolerate, however, was any suggestion of his own royal authority being questioned. The royal supremacy over church and state was the foundation of his position as king of England, the very reason he felt so at home in this marvelous new country he had inherited. The melding of secular and religious authority had been the secret at the heart of the immensely successful Tudor monarchy. So melding these things together. And the new churches had established themselves as powers quite distinct from and independent of the state. So that was becoming a problem for his their power. So um, up here, he says, um, they had a, to establish themselves as politically loyal, even while asking for changes to the state religion and the, the form of the state church. And this is talking about the, um, the people who... Like the, I believe it was the Puritans. Yeah, so the Puritans were having problems because they couldn't say anything against his power. And it was equally critical for the bishops to conflate them. Throughout the summer, the bishops maintained that any questioning of the doctrine and articles of the Church of England was politically subversive, dangerous, and to be expunged. Anti-Puritan propaganda flooded the country. Because they didn't want the Puritans up there telling the truth, they're trying to, they're just trying to take power away from the Pope. So um, it says they wanted to distinguish themselves from the true extremists who took from the New Testament that each congregation should be independent and free of all worldly authority. Oh, like the New Testament? Yeah, that's right. But as faithful servants of Christ and loyal subjects, and then. Um, let me see. There was another one I wanted to read. Let me see. Oh, yeah, right here. So they addressed James. They said, neither as fa factious men affecting a popular parity, or, yeah, parity in the church, no hint of getting rid of the bishops, because that's what they're saying. They're talking about getting rid of the bishops, nor as schism schismatics aiming at dissolution of the state ecclesiastical they wanted to distinguish themselves from the true extremists who took from the new testament that each congregation should be independent and free of all worldly authority <laughs> that's exactly what you're supposed to do you're supposed to follow christ even if that means that they come to your house and burn your house down so okay that's a just a couple and i had said that i was going to do one more if i run out of time sorry I'm just, um, I gotta go and search for another book that I have. Uh, where is it? My, my books always disappear. Uh, you know what? It's out in my car. All right, so, um,
But even right here, even right here in this book right here, the um, light from the ancient east, he, he's explaining to you that the original Christians were poor. They're not these like rich people nowadays. It was poor people. So um, let me see. All right, so it just it talks about um, here. I'll just um, read a little bit here. This fatal generalization involves, of course, a great mistake. The upper classes have been simply focused with the whole body of society, or to employ another expression, primitive Christianity has been compared with an incommensurable quantity. By its social structure, primitive Christianity points unequivocally to the lower and middle class. Its connections with the upper classes are very scanty at the outset. Jesus of Nazareth was a carpenter, Paul of Tarsus a tent maker, and the tent maker's words about the origin of his churches in the lower classes of the great towns form one of the most important testimonies, historically speaking, that primitive Christianity gives of itself. Primitive Christianity is another instance of the truth taught us with each return of springtime that the sap rises upward from below. Primitive Christianity stood in natural opposition to the high culture of the ancient world, not so much because it was Christianity, but because it was a movement of the lower classes. The only, compar the only comparison possible, therefore, is that between the Christians and the corresponding spiritual province among the pagans, that is, the masses of the ancient world. So it goes on and on. Yeah, so Christianity was uh, um, was poor. That's why so much stuff, um, you can't even find out a lot of its beginnings is because it didn't, um, most of the educated men were the rich people and um, the people who could afford to um, really write it down and take care of it and education. Education is having a, a lot of um, educated people is a fairly n novel thing as a result of the Industrial Revolution. So um, anyways, that's all I got for y'all for now, and um, thanks for watching. So we learned a little bit about the hierarchy of the church, and the original hierarchy was that there was no hierarchy. It was um, poor people who came and fellowship together, as we can see from 1 Corinthians um, chapter... 14 and um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, like 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, those are all good ones about the original church and how it operated. So, all right, thanks for watching, guys. Bye.